Welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast, the podcast where we talk about sexual abuse cases in the hope that it will assist listeners in openly discussing topics which have been ignored for too long. This podcast is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. We are lawyers, so we tend to speak about the legal aspects of abuse cases, but we aren't too shy to speak up about the broader issues faced by survivors of sexual abuse too. We hope that you find it interesting, but more than that, if you are a survivor of sexual abuse, we hope that you find our discussion empowering. Hello, podcast listeners. My name is Alan Collins. I'm the partner who heads up the abuse team at Hugh James, and I'm joined once more by Professor Michael Sorter, Professor of Criminology at the University of New South Wales. Hello, Michael. Great to be with you, Alan. Thank you very much. Those listeners who are regulars will have known that in our last podcast, I was discussing with Michael his research with his colleague, Tim Wong, titled The Impact of COVID-19 on the Risk of Online Child Sexual Exploitation and the Implications for Child Protection and Policing. And we were looking at the research that Michael and Tim had undertaken and the findings of that research. And in this podcast, we're going to be looking at the lessons that perhaps can be learned and recommendations. In other words, what do we need to do in the future in case there is another crisis, pandemic or otherwise? So, Michael, we were talking about some pretty fundamental findings in your research, one of which was concerned with the impact of the pandemic and with it the lockdown on education, because Over recent years, great efforts have been made in certain parts to get into schools and communities to explain to children and young people the risks of online exploitation. And that was interrupted. And that has, unfortunately, implications. So there are lessons to be learned from what has happened over the last year, 18 months. And I think, you know, all over the world, you know, the vast, vast majority of schools were closed and they were shut down for months. And we all knew that this was going to have an impact. And your research found that there was an impact. So let's talk about the impact on educating young people about the risks of sexual exploitation. And what are the lessons? Look, I think it was interesting to hear from so many of the agencies around the world that work in this space who are still relying on, you know, going down, speaking to school kids, talking to them about the issue of online abuse. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, it is the sort of talk that I used to get about stranger danger when I was in primary school in 1986. And so it's worth sort of thinking about how online safety needs to be woven more directly into school curricula in different sorts of ways, in more integrated ways. I think it would be good as well if public policy decisions like lockdowns had, I suppose, a more comprehensive view about the long-term implications. You know, we know here in Australia, for example, that lockdown has coincided with increased reports of child sexual exploitation directly to our kids' helpline. That, that kids on lockdown as a result of being on lockdown have been more at risk in certain ways. That's true also when we think about domestic violence and so on. But I do think there's been a tendency of governments to make decisions, necessary decisions around things like lockdown without then planning out the very, very likely future outcomes. At this point in Australia, from what we can tell, child protection notifications dropped last year by 30%. Now, that's a lot of abused kids whose abuse and neglect has gone unnoticed. Yes, and that is a terrible price that they are paying or are going to have to pay. And so with that in mind, I think what your research paper shows is that this needs to be interwoven into crisis planning in the future. I think that's right. I mean, I think there's a need to, to, to weave it into crisis planning. I think there's also just a need to integrate online safety agencies into the child protection system and that this kind of online safety issue, you know, it, it hasn't been foundational to child protection. Child protection as a system has evolved very much in the offline world. How can we achieve better integration between online safety stakeholders and the traditional child protection system. So I think that's another sort of key learning for us. And also, you know, my my view, and I've, I've said this before, but 
you know, we also when we talk about integrating all stakeholders, that includes technology companies who at the moment have very little child protection obligations to the public. They're not required to abide by any reasonable child protection standards. Now, that appears to be shifting in the, the UK with the advent of the online safety bill, but it really is worth reflecting on how extraordinary it is that we have millions, if not billions of kids on Facebook and Instagram and so on, and that these companies which actively court a young consumer base are not expected to keep kids and young people safe in the same way that another child-focused institution would be. Yes, and the problem is not going to go away by itself. And Your research shows that the problem is increasing. And of course, allied to that is the fact that the research shows that offenders are very adaptable. And whilst lockdown may have prevented them having physical access so readily, their ability to offend, however, has evolved dramatically. And so, you know, they've become even more adaptable in using social media in accessing children and young people in order to try and abuse them. Part of the research, which is not in the report, but we'll be publishing later this year, was actually an analysis of dark web offender conversations about COVID-19. So we looked last year at at what were people on the dark web actually saying about child sexual abuse and and COVID-19 and lockdown. There was actually a surprising number of references on the dark web to frustration about the way in which lockdown was interrupting offender access, physical access to kids. So offenders actually talked quite a lot about, you know, I was abusing this child and and now I can't because of of, of lockdown. I suspect that offenders that are actually were actually on lockdown with a child probably wouldn't be boasting about it online because that's just a red flag to to, to law enforcement. But you know, we saw a real pivot in offender communities to consuming child sexual abuse material, a strong focus on child sexual abuse material, and also a strong focus on looking to find ways to access kids. And unfortunately, it's just, you know, online platforms and services just make it so easy for offenders to search out kids, you know. So it's it's no longer kind of the, the weirdo stranger hanging around a playground anymore. Instead, it's frankly a weirdo sitting there with his computer and potentially, you know, making contact with 100 kids in an hour. And and all that this guy needs is one kid to make a mistake. That really is their attitude. They are kind of seeking to groom kids at scale and just looking for that one kid who slips up. Yes. And there's a new term or word in the lexicology, which is sextortion. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, really, really, I mean, obviously all of this is really grim, but particularly, to be honest, with girl victims, we see offenders using sextortion quite extensively in order to solicit more more material. With the boys, when they're sextorting, it's often actually for, for money. So we'll, we've seen more than once young boys where they're basically being forced to go to their mum's purse and get out her credit card and share the credit card details. So there, there's lots of this sorts of activity that gets out of control for kids very quickly. And then the question is, who do they talk to? They're often quite afraid of speaking to their parents. They're really afraid of getting in trouble. And offenders will play on this. So offenders will tell them, you know, don't don't tell your parents they're going to kill you, that sort of thing. And so kids will actually try and, and resolve this. They often do first go to the platform. They often reach out to the platform to try and resolve it rather than go to their parents or to, to police. So I think there's a lot of work to do in terms of making sure the response they get from the platform is appropriate, but also how do we promote the comfort of children that, that they can speak to their parents and that that's the safest thing to do. We also find, and this came through quite strongly in this research, that you know children are really scared of police. They're really scared of, of telling police when something has happened to them. So how do we also create a soft landing for young people to engage with law enforcement in a way that they're comfortable with? Yeah, and I think that is a considerable issue for our times, you know, which is why is it that young people are so reluctant, if not scared, of contacting the police? You know, it should not be like that. And I think that is a it's an appalling it's appalling that there is that impression, there is that feeling. And it, you know, it is 
incumbent on government and law enforcement to address it. And it comes feeds into education, doesn't it? You know, it's education of young people has been interrupted by the lockdown. And your research shows, does it not, that there are lessons to be learned there. But, you know, education has to be even more effective. One of the key recommendations from the report is the need for more comprehensive services for victims and survivors of online abuse. We've got this global network of of tip lines who take reports of online abuse, but really their core function is to seek removal of child sexual abuse material. Mm. For the most part, very few of those tip lines provide anything like comprehensive advice, support or care. They're just trying to get illegal content taken down. So unfortunately, we're in a position where, you know, victims and survivors and sometimes their families don't have anywhere to go to get advice, don't have anywhere to go to get referrals to uh, appropriate services. These are really complex cases when kids have been abused online. They can be very extreme cases, but very complex from a legal point of view, a mental health point of view, from a welfare point of view, child protection and so on. And often the offences have taken place across multiple jurisdictions and multiple agencies might need to be involved. And of course, a child can't manage that, but nor necessarily can the parent of the child. So, you know, we really are advocating for government investment in support services that are appropriate for young people so that young people can come into a phone line or a tip line, they can talk, they can be heard, and then there's a way to start to expand services to that young person that actually ameliorates their core needs. Because at the moment, I have to say they, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but it, it, I think it's true, they're kind of on their own. They are, that's so, you know, as, as um, we're talking and I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, actually, if this happened to me or someone in my family or someone I knew or whatever, actually, what do I do? You yes. think, well, yeah, I know um, I ought to telephone the police and tell them, but mm. what else? What, what's going to happen? How do you deal with it? You know, lots and lots of questions with actually no answers. And here's, you know, here's me who is supposed to be a so-called lawyer who specialises in representing people who've been sexually assaulted and abused and so on. And I'm actually asking myself, actually, what does happen? What would I do? What's going to happen next? And, and, you know, to be frank, I'm not sure. I, I think these are questions that governments are starting to ask. I think there's an awareness, there's a growing awareness now that this is actually a really long standing gap in, in public policy and in service provision. You know, online abuse and child sexual abuse material the response to it really has been law enforcement led for a long time in terms of seeking offenders and and prosecuting. The response system in terms of removing child sexual abuse material is quite passive. So they remove material that is reported, but there's actually very little proactive searching for material in order to remove it. And as a result, you know, every year we're seeing massive escalations year on year in the number of, of reports. So I think all of the indicators are that, you know, the pool of victims is growing, the availability of child sexual abuse material is growing after 20 years of of, of effort. And COVID-19 is just a perfect storm, I think, which has brought a lot of the, the gaps and the contradictions of the current system have been made visible by COVID-19. So I think this is an opportunity to stop and reset and think about not just the next pandemic, but, but really, what are we going to do as an international community to turn those indicators around so that year on year there's fewer victims, the victims that we have have got better outcomes, and there's less abuse material available rather than more? Thank you very much, Michael. On that very thought-provoking note, we'll end our podcast. That's absolutely um, fascinating for all the wrong reasons, but extremely important, and I hope our listeners thought so too. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of HJ Talks About Abuse. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you'd like to speak to us about something you've heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at aboutabuse at hjtalks.co.uk.